so I would like to thank Samir first. He touched upon two things, user research and the importance of a minimal viable feature kind of a prototype. Uh, in this particular project uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about my learnings and how I've always tried uh, ethnography and uh, see how it feeds up to the data that we obtain from our different products. Uh, I am an HCI researcher and a designer working with Xerox and I have worked on domains in healthcare, education and I am going to take you through my presentation and learnings using a case study which we recently concluded uh, in which we actually did user research with uh, caregivers and patients with chronic, chronic illness for a long time and on the way during the user research we we actually built a minimal viable prototype, so to say, uh, which was purely meant as a technical probe during the research process. And it actually led to all the ethnography insights feeding it into design of our data analytics framework. So looking at a typical human-centered design process, our project actually began with going to field, doing some observation, maybe doing secondary research, reading blogs, reading research papers in the same domain, uh, then collecting stories in the field, uh, trying to derive some themes out of it, and what could be converted into some kind of a product implication or opportunity areas that we could actually propose to different product managers. Uh, then prototype some solutions that could be actually presented uh, in, a, in a product showcase workshop kind of thing, test them and implement them. And during this process actually, uh, you you start building uh, with a concrete focus during the research. Uh, somewhere in between it becomes abstract and you try to find out abstract themes around it. And once you have identified certain themes, it again becomes concrete. So our ethnography study was close to around six to seven months. And somewhere between we actually thought uh, that the insights that we are getting from the field, uh, we should actually build an evidential proof for that and that's when we actually built a data ecosystem. Uh, now I'll actually go to the details of it but uh, this is something that I try in other projects as well and I'll give you a, an example around that. But during the end when the research was still in progress we started getting this ontological understanding. So people who are here from information science or computer science would understand ontology. Uh, it's nothing but a thing in the universe and its relationship with other things. And uh, the title of my presentation talks about user knowledge generation. And that's not user data. What I really mean is having an ontological understanding of the user. If you speak about one user, how do you identify different things, different uh, other users in the ecosystem, different type of product, and how the user actually interacts with them and gets affected by them. That's, that's user knowledge generation and I'm going to talk about how an ontological understanding was built based on the data analytics framework. So briefly touching about ethnography, what we do, these are the two different type of ethnography processes uh, followed across globally. One is participant observation in which researchers actually go to the field, uh, very unstructured approach, they end up taking hours and hours of collecting hours and hours of video data, audio data, uh, transcripts. They speak with users, again very unstructured, uh, build journey map, uh, space diagrams, and then bring back to their labs or setups and analyze them. The second is key informant interviews in which uh, you actually identify a purposive sample. Uh, they may be experts of your user or potential users of your product and uh, you actually do interview, conduct interviews with them. Mm, this is more of a structured approach and sometime you miss out on some of the context. So there are like other terms other researchers do, they, they call it contextual inquiry. Uh, and then there is third which is focus group study, uh, which brings in good elements of both the approaches in which you have uh, a more snowball kind of a sample coming together and you try to build a context which is similar to the context you want to do your participant observation. You give them certain tasks, may, maybe have them run through 
an exercise or a, or a competition and during the process you actually talk with them and collect data. So ethnography is actually like writing about people and when your researchers go into the field, do all of these things, they collect a lot of subjective data. Uh, subjective in terms of interpretation because every user is different. Whereas when we talk about data analytics, now this particular term thick data was actually first uh, mentioned by Trisha Wong, an ex-frog researcher. And she actually told that big data, which is really the user, usage archive, this hard-coded objective data about the user, they, they talk, they give quantitative numbers, uh, they, they actually rely on machine learning because you have to actually run through them, uh, analyze it for a long hour. And they talk about distribution, like how the 20 percentile uh, of the users are using 80 percent of the features. Or maybe what is the dropout rate and what are the features they are not using. Whereas when we talk about thick data, which really comes from field studies or user research, this brings in a lot of qualitative uh, data to the table. It delivers stories. So when we have done ethnography and talked with product managers, so and, and we have always felt this unease when we present these stories during the initial phases of research uh, because they cannot connect with that. So really the thick data talks about these stories. It relies on human learning. The more you do research, you, the more you become observant. You, you learn the art of looking and not seeing. And it actually tells about archetype. Uh, when you do ethnography, you actually learn about your supermans or batmans or black widows who are going to use their product. But when you do actually the, actually just, just the big data, rely on just the big data, you're only get, going to get uh, like information about the user. With archetypes, I mean, uh, when we do research, when we talk talk with these different users, we always keep in keep keep this thing back in our mind that uh, all the statements that they are telling, we need to build an archetype persona uh, so that we can actually think of all the exhaustive features when we are back in the analysis board. So in this particular work, uh, we were doing ethnography of chronic caregivers ecosystem. Uh, and we started with secondary research. We started looking at the research papers around that. Uh, to the left, uh, like all these papers, they actually talk come from social science, uh, some from user research, actual ethnography conferences. And they talk about different aspects of how it's not just about patients. Uh, there is three lines of work involved there, where there are three different type of users. When I talk about uh, a, a patient as a thing in the ecosystem. The, all of these actually talk about the kind of work, the kind of different uh, partners involved. And uh, when we actually, like during the middle phase of this research, when we are actually reading about this, one of our colleague actually told, used the term that it's spaghetti bowl of data. Uh, now this guy was a principal, uh, is a principal interaction designer, and uh, he was looking at this particular study that how the insights could be converted into some kind of a, uh, a variable design or a physiological sensor that could feed in to the different product suits that we have. Uh, when we looked at uh, product design and computer human interaction literature, they talk about a lot of approaches in which designers have gone into field, studied, built certain element, built certain product, and uh, like did a usability study, uh, build that, have that pilot, have, have users use them, and they have reported about different kind of finding. But we found one clear pattern that they didn't look at all the aspects that they could gather from the field, uh, and more it was like a technologically deterministic point of view. Uh, somewhere in between, they were actually trying to oversimplify. So oversimplify in terms the kind of spaghetti bowl of data that was coming from the field, real, real field, when we actually talk about just one product, it's, it kind of depends on the uh, technology that we are selecting while designing the product and kind of simplifies the problem. So 
going back again uh, where to, to actually where to start, uh, all these uh, literature survey have helped us to identify two ma major bases. Uh, since we were focusing on building a variable or a physiological sensor kind of product, we looked at what are the different self-care behaviors. These self-care behaviors are important because end of the day patient is going to wear the design and uh, and it talks about a lot of things. Uh, the, these actually come from healthcare research, uh, healthy eating, being physically active uh, and so, so on and so forth. And we also looked at what the social science research brings in, brings into the table, that is three lines of work. Because we wanted our product solution to be really effective. Uh, so these three lines of uh, work actually talk about the three different categories of uh, users involved in the ecosystem, not only just the patient, and uh, the kind of prof professional training required for specific kind of work uh, as compared to a lot of work which doesn't require that kind of professional training. So this was our sample. We were doing chronic disease management, uh, studying chronic disease management in India, uh, and talk, particularly talking about India. And since we were looking at the ecosystem, so the social construct itself is comes into picture because we are mostly joint families. Uh, we interact with neighbors a lot. We have close knit families. Uh, we looked at 18 families on three different tier two cities. Uh, Majorly, these chronic diseases, uh, which are also moreover insidious in nature because when diabetes comes, it also brings along hypertension and arthritis, uh, and similarly brings along renal disease problem, brings along, brings along hypertension. So in all our sample, all the 18 families, we found that these patients have one or multiple of such symptoms. And when we were looking at this, since we were looking at the families, uh, we were also looking at the kind of caregivers involved, staying with the patient or staying away from patient situated. Uh, so I'm going to use further, further use this, these terms, situated caregivers, in-person caregivers, or remote caregivers. And uh, what are the different kind of activities and responsibilities exchanges that happen among the caregivers? So. Talking about the interviews, uh, this was actually informant uh, interview process that we lead to. And we identified these 18 families. We had to interview the patient as well as the key primary caregiver in the family. There were 36 interviews. Uh, the key theme that we used, these, uh, and each theme would have uh, multiple questions. Uh, we would go them uh, one and after another, or maybe based on the conversation, we'll switch. Uh, so this was a more structured questionnaire. But as in the previous talk, uh, somebody told that you keep asking whys. So we were making sure that to actually get the new stories, we'll keep asking these why, be it five times to one statement. We'll keep asking these why so that uh, uh, we actually, the, the, the kind of findings that we get are more contextual, in particular to that user. Uh, so, a lot of data we got, we, we converted all the audio transcripts, audio recordings into uh, these sort of spreadsheet, which would mention about the, maybe first statement would be just the introduction about the user, but following statements will be different responses we got, and if responses are related, we'll keep right next to each other. And that way we had actually for 36 users, we had these kind of data. Now, I'm actually going to talk about how we derive themes from that, uh, because that's the process part of it and it's pretty important. Uh, we coded the data as device techniques. So for example, when a caregiver mentioned that his, his father had uh, renal disorder and not allowed to have more than two liters of water a day. He was actually giving uh, two thirds of ice with water every time. So that was a devised technique that caregiver had built on his own. So every statement we obtained, uh, when it indicated towards some kind of a workaround users have created on their own to solve some problem, we tagged that particular statement as device technique. Similarly, breakdowns, 
breakdown indicated about the failure of the system, uh, starting from mild breakdowns, which could be just the pain points and the pressure points, as the users mentioned. But breakdowns are like the major break, uh, major failures of the system. We tag certain sentences as contextual interpretations. These are the interpretations uh, we as designers were gathering while we are talking and certain design ideas that would come. During the affinity analysis, we came up with a bunch of themes. I'm going to talk about just a few briefly. But we were actually, we, we took all these sentences, mixed them up, and then during the analysis, we were finding sentences based on similarities. So what are these user statements uh, indicating towards a similar context? Uh, relationship, what are these, uh, what all of these user statements are indica were indicating towards uh, similar outcomes and uh, proximity, are there one reason leading to another outcome and vice versa, that, uh, so that way we were actually tagging and identifying these user statements and that helped us build certain themes. So I'm only going to touch upon some of the themes and quickly move into uh, further details. So one theme that came from actual field study is the level of trust and assurance. We found out levels of levels in trust and uh, assurance is quite different when the caregiver is actually filial as compared to caregiver uh, who is actually conjugal as in marital partner or filial as in son or daughter taking care of the patient. Uh, so, so, so these filial caregivers were seeking continuous assurance as compared to uh, as compared to the partners who were aware of the general uh, general uh, e general ecosystem or behavior of the patient because of the sense of that growing old together. We found out that filials, especially those who were in person staying with staying with patients, uh, they had their own way of motivating and persuading the caregiver. But that was totally absent when uh, when, when these caregivers were remote. And interesting uh, and intriguing fi finding that we had was uh, there were these relationship friction because of role reversal. So, so these patients, they had been taking care of the family for a very long time and suddenly the roles have reversed. So that has again uh, brought down certain reasons for friction, uh, certain reasons for not, not feeling self-reliant and uh, the kind of data that uh, that came to us and when we actually put went back to all the data and tried to put it based on the kind of emerging themes we found, we came up with this uh, quadrant where we where the filial caregivers and uh, the trust and assurance level were pretty high in this case but they were also a uh, lot of deceiving happening and this was actually uh, again, going back to that statement of my colleague that it, this was actually a spaghetti bowl of data and uh, when, we, uh, when we intend to show this to somebody who comes with hardcore computer science background, uh, will not be able to make a sense of it. And uh, we know that, we knew that where there is a interplay of trust and relationship that we have studied, uh, maybe that is correct or maybe more insights that we have to do, but there is also a health data ecosystem that we can capture and get evidences from, from the data that we have and the data that we got from ethnography. That's when we built this prototype. It's a classical example of uh, you are building a technical probe uh, that's not going to sell. This was just built for the study. Uh, we, we had uh, some six families volunteer. So, so this, this had a simple physiological sensors that would uh, identify certain activities such as uh, walking, such as eating if you have a tilt action for a re repeated number of time. RFID readers would actually tell, tell about medicine intake followed by a tilt action. And, and real-time clock will, will basically tell about the kind of time of rest, the total time of rest for the patient. And we had uh, this particular armband uh, had 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 the patients to use this for a period of 10 minutes, uh, 10 days, beg your pardon. 
during this time the 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 the, the variable was actually gathering data and sending notifications to the caregiver and uh, as the data that we were receiving was the call logs from the caregivers what are the kind of activities which had happened at patient end and what are the kind of sms's that were sent to the caregiver are the caregivers responding to these kind of sms's uh, if let's say there is a intervention requirement do they actually call back and remind their parents uh, they were implicit versus explicit actions that would just happen just because of a message being sent or implicit as a general behavior uh, and and we were trying to identify are there any corresponding pattern hidden between the kind of uh, interactions caregiver do when this kind of uh, data being sent to them so we had this data ecosystem work with all of these families and we did semi structured interviews post pilot uh what is interesting is uh, there there are certain findings but i am going to talk about these findings when i talk about challenges uh this kind of a data ecosystem that we had built and the understanding from the ethnography that we need to actually identify all of those things in the ecosystem had led us to build uh build an ontological framework now this particular thing is a screenshot of a ontology uh, web ontology language in which uh, these five information which is essentially the information about the patient isbar whenever a doctor communicates with a nurse certified nursing assistant they they actually tell about the patient in these five info, five data point which is identify about the patient age sex uh uh situate about the patient what is the current situation background what was the medicine given to the patient assessment what's the current assessment what is the medicine required and uh, response so what the like what is the nurse supposed to do and this is way uh, uh, in these five term terminologies all the healthcare communication happens so we picked up this healthcare web ontological language and we found out that till this date uh, the the patient thing information had only these things there will be a uh, owl files for diabetes there will be owl files for other other diseases other medical complications but they they had never had uh, a caregiver as a part of it this is a simp simplistic screenshot that in which there is only one caregiver and uh, and and this is this is just the wrapper of the database but uh, i suggest that yeah it's it's difficult to show the what's going on and what are the different kind of data that could go if we have multiple type of caregiver and uh, if it's a healthcare service provider location where are, where there are multiple caregivers uh, taking care of inpatient as well as outpatients uh, this is a comp very complex data so we 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 were able to have capture these different users ecosystem <coughs> and that's where the ethnography finding kind of led us to have uh, not only just the patient but uh, but but actually a 360 degree feedback working between the data ecosystem as well as the trust and relationship the the findings from the ethnography so i'll give you uh, certain examples for example uh, when when these messages were sent to the caregivers the kind of uh, evening discussions the coffee discussion used to happen the the total period of time actually elongated to almost three times uh, this came out from the post pilot interview uh, at times so so we had taken care of uh, when the patients don't use the device during the pilot so at times patients were not using it and uh, we we actually sent the message to the caregiver so so that led to some kind of a discussion and uh, possibly it was an argument actually so 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 this kind of a technical probe that we had sent to the field had also brought certain behavioral changes uh, or or determinant shift to the user behavior so to say uh so so based on this framework that we have designed probably uh, in future we can have data coming in from multiple variables we will have data about 
knowledge of or experience of caregiving about the caregivers, different things in the ecosystem, and uh, possible medical technologies can actually be uh, able to identify the best intervention, best communication corresponding to different responsible caregivers in the ecosystem and use that kind of a framework. Uh, as a system in action, we were able to uh, include caregivers contextual information to the system. So, for example, one of the findings from ethnography that we had was uh, when the posts are passed from doctor to nurse and nurse, let's say a conjugal caregiver, if the conjugal caregiver is not an expert, and most of the cases she was not an expert, she had a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, she felt more comfortable with the nurse as compared to the doctor because she could talk in the same language with the nurse. Uh, it's just the difference in the experience and the knowledge. Uh, whereas this this was never found. Uh, this was never found with females as caregivers because we always go back and. Google if they are not confident about certain things. We were able to recommend uh, personalized intervention reporting. Uh, so this is just that uh, uh, we are not only talking about the patient, but if we have three or multiple caregivers involved in the system, uh, we could easily identify what kind of activity can be done by a caregiver. And, and we eventually also enabled a many-to-many -many patient caregiver intention intervention. Now, the most important part in all of this journey where we actually did uh, ethnography and somewhere in between we implemented a data ecosystem and how things got, came in together is uh, you need to, you need to actually identify the right sample during your entire study. Uh, we were fortunate enough that actually these six families got agreed for the 10 day long pilot. Uh, but many a times uh, that will not be the case. So, 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 as researchers, we need to actually be careful about that and uh, keep persuading and have 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 these participants become the important part of the study. Have them uh, feel that they are the contributor during the study, so they can actually be along with you and uh, continue helping you as as data point. Uh, the probe can bring in determinant shift in user behavior. Now, this particular example is just in the caregiving ecosystem. For example, research, uh, let's say for e-commerce shopping behavior, and we, we build a, a beta prototype and, uh, and, and send it across to certain percentage of users to identify what they are doing with the prototype. Now, itself, on its quality or based on the kind of features that we have built can bring in a lot of deterministic behavior. So that should not bias the findings that we have. And there is always, uh, there should be always a very incremental uh, shift when we are actually trying to implement any such technical probe in the field. Uh, an important thing during such study is uh, identifying what we are trying to assess from the study. Now in this particular case, uh, all the families found the particular device and the communication mechanism happening uh, pretty useful, but we could not report effectiveness of such a system. So, 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 so there are definitely these three uh, triangles when we are trying to study and identify uh, effectiveness of a system is, uh, are we going to study the perceived usefulness of a product or a service, or are we going to study the adoption of a product or a service, or just the effectiveness. Uh, that will actually help us design our research in a much better manner. In this particular case, we were actually just looking at uh, the perceived usefulness, and if in future this kind of a data ecosystem exists, how it's going to help or, or play out in the overall caregiving scenario. And fourth and the most important thing is uh, most of the time, participants will not use your technical probe. So, so, so you will have to have ways to identify when it is being not used or when it is being abused. So actually you can, that also feeds in as a form of data in your research. Yep. 
Thank you. This was the team who was with us. Any questions? Uh, hi. hi. So, uh, mostly the ethnography is more about uh, qualitative research, right? So, uh, so I, I, I just want to know, like, uh, how do you, so the sample size which you take is very small to yeah, do a we, qualitative research. So, so we, we started with 18 families. Okay. Uh, generally, you can start with uh, seven to nine. Yeah. And you should always look back and do this affinity analysis till the time you get a theoretical saturation. Okay. Uh, oftentimes, timeline of the project itself uh, works as a constraint, but uh, I think starting with a reasonable sample size of nine. So how do you uh, like? How do you manage not to fall under? So b because most of your results are based on the users, right? So yes. how do you manage not to fall uh, your results to be more biased toward the sample size that you have taken? Uh, so mostly in these kind of study, uh, I, I'll just talk about this study. We did a purposive sampling. Uh, there was strict questionnaire in which we were actually trying to screen these families. Uh, only the families which had more, like any mem one member or more than one member had a, uh, had these chronic conditions, uh, had caregivers who have been taking care of the, the patients for more than five years or so. Uh, so. So, so we, yeah, and, and as I mentioned in the previous, uh, when, when I was explaining about thick data, uh, a lot of times, some of the interviews, we will, we will be having these Supermans and Bat Batmans, R-type personas arriving, but they could also be outliers in the system. So, so some of the outliers are easily recognizable when you are doing analysis. Uh, yeah, so you should actually not consider it as a part of the user statements while analyzing. And uh, another question is, uh, so uh, ethnography is generally like a, a long-term process, like, like I've seen people do for like years. So how, how do you, uh, you know, how do you keep track on your initial objective and like if, like in, in time it might change, like how do you decide, okay, this is the changing point and I have to tra change my track and then again do, a, so how, how, how does that happen? Uh, that's a very good question and uh, Mostly, uh, so so I come from a background of a design research, and uh, I try to find a middle ground uh, by doing contextual inquiry. And because ethnography actually comes from anthropological science, in which we had these renowned ethnographers staying with these societies for a very long time, they used to write about uh, ethic perspective, like an outsider perspective of the society, and then emic as an insider perspective of the society, and it's a long, very long process, but uh, in the in the fast times that we live now, we need to identify and maybe, maybe focus on. So, so some people try to uh, uh, try to focus on the kind of problems that they are going to focus on. Uh, so, so yeah, there, there is always a middle ground that you'll have to identify, uh, but you can all, always go for a long term ethnography as well. Do you, do you have did you had any uh, you know? Uh, experience in changing your objective in whatever you, your project was, like, was there any... Uh, could you repeat the question? Uh, like, before starting the uh, studies, you might have a, you know, a problem statement to, start, so, to solve. Like, yes. did it change eventually when you are doing your studies? Like? Yeah, most of the time, problem statements change when you do these periodic affinity analysis. Mm -hmm. But you kind of report the holistic findings, insights that you have. Uh, and, and they should actually change the kind of questionnaires you build after these every periodic analysis. The question questionnaire should also evolve because you will every time find a new insight or new 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 fruit for thought actually. Thank you. Hello, nice talk. Hi. So uh, the research that you talked about so is it only after the, pro the MVP has been made or does it apply even before you know what we want to do? Say, uh, uh, 
in startups right so you can't make the whole thing and then show then the whole if it doesn't if the perceived usefulness is not there then the whole work has been wasted so uh, are the techniques that you talked about uh, apply even before the product conceptualization yeah so i think uh, when you are in t- like building a variable you will also have to go through building these kind of mvp uh, this particular mvp or was only used for a pilot or a technical probe during interviews but even for product design you will have in not only just one but multiple versions and they will improve during the study okay does that answer your question i mean generally we show designs and they say yeah it's it 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 would help us but later when the product is rolled out uh, it turns out that ad- adoption wasn't good so how do you I mean, yeah, the mvp so, ultimately turns out to be the product itself so how do you get the right balance between uh, the pilot project and so not becoming is, a exhaustive this, effort. this was just a probe we only had one version but uh, let me talk like let's just talk about a website or a web product uh, we will have multiple versions they will not be as expensive to build or we we can actually easily get users have them use and get feedback from them so so there is also difference in uh, trade off that we have to do the kind of product that we are building sometimes a mobile app could be very easy but let's say we have to build a uh, for example a automobile so it will have an incremental we will have incremental mvps being built for that and not multiple versions Thank you.